All right, so chapter five, Mission Impossible. Also, there was a game on the same chapter called the Central Cribs. And they were located right across from the Front Street Watch Cribs on the other side of Central, where it would be located now would be the Circle City Pine Rouge. That was all Crip neighborhood. And the bounty hunters had to go through there 1973 and 1974 to do some, some cleaning, cleaning up. And they got turned out real quick. Now, was, was Mac Thomas living over there? Because before he moved to Compton, he lived right on, I believe, 109? On the other, on side. The other side. On the north That's side. It. On the side going towards Avalon. Oh, okay. The Central Crips was on the side going from Central on back towards the Hacienda's, going towards where the Bounty Hunter stage is at. See, that is Bounty Hunter stage right there. But on the other side is this Crip stage on the Jack in the Box side. So them Central Crips right there, uh, I witnessed myself. It's in my book. Also, no details, but I will tell you this much. In 1974, the people who I ran with, they were the last of the ones who put work in on the Central Crips that turned them out. They didn't exist no more in 74 because I saw what happened to them with my own eyes. So this is, we're talking about 74. Okay, so by, so by then, Mac Thomas had already moved to Compton. I think he got to Compton around 72, 73. Well, let me tell you something, man. It is what it is, man. Yeah. Everybody put a 10 on that Mike Thomas started the Compton Crips. But from my understanding, and I got good ears, and I'm not no retard, and I have, have pretty good sense. It wasn't Mac Thomas that really started the Compton Crips. It was Arthur, Day, Head Honcho, and Mac Thomas, little brother, M Melvin Thomas. Now, when Mac Thomas got out of prison, or YA, he took over that, but he didn't start that, he didn't origin that, He's just like a LB. He came and he set it on fire. So the guys who started it is mediocre. But the guy who put, you know, your mama used to say, I put my foot in that soup and I know it tastes real good, don't it? Well, he put his fist in it, literally. You know what I'm saying? He, he ran that with an iron fist. So therefore, like I say, it don't, the, the reputation don't always go to the people who started something. Sometimes it goes to the person who pushed that line to the fullest. Yeah, but him, him uh, Mac Thomas and Arthur Day were very tight. They ran together. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, 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 he, he saved that for him. That was a gift. He, they did that and gave that to Mac. You know what I'm saying? They gave that to Mac, but he wasn't there when they started it. He came and took over. He, he, he took his, in other words, it's just like a king, man. If a king get captured in a battle, mm -hmm. Whenever they decide to release that king, he's going to take his throne right back. So if the king of, of Nigeria is fighting the king from South Africa, even though he lost the battle, he still don't lose his kingdomship. Because as long as he's living, he's still a king. So when they release him 20 years later or 10 years later, he go right back to his kingdom. Even though somebody else had took over, babysitted his kingdom while he captured by the enemy, but once the enemy released that king, he's going right back to his throne. And that's how I look at it as an LB thing and a thing dealing with Mac Thomas. Was, was Mac Thomas in, in YTS when the bottom rules were, were being formed too? Because he did a little bit of time. He was in time, TS. Huh? He was not And you know what? I don't know how serious this is, but it was always a serious rumor of Mac Thomas having a fist to cuff fight with my homeboy Mario Gray. And I even asked AC about it, because he was there, I believe. He always mentioned about my homeboy Mario Gray. And the word was Mario Gray, being that he lived on Lansing, the borderline of the East Side Crypt, where Ricky Sidney's them live at, and where he stayed at, but he lived on the Bonnie Hunter side. Uh, I used to see Ricky Sidney's creep over his, on Lansing a couple of times. And, you know, so they got people that creep on borderlines just to test the water. So they always thought Mario from the Crip side was going to be with them because he went to Lock High. So when he started hanging out with the Bounty Hunters in 72 and still going to Lock High, they probably still thought he was a Crip. But when they end up in YTS 
and 74, 75, they probably still thought he was a crib. But they see him rolling with the body hunters. Now they got a problem with that because they didn't know he was hanging with the body hunters. But Mario been hanging with the body hunters since 72. But the Crips always knew him from Lock High. So now they mad at him. And, and now when the red flags start coming in to YTS, Mario Gray was the main guy that was getting all the red bandanas from females that was coming up visiting them. He was pushing the line. And from my understanding, Mac Thomas didn't like that because he always thought Mario was more, had more potential to be a Crip because they lived it on the borderline, which is Lansing. But Mario always hung with us since 72. I remember me and Mario used to be on buses together and the Crips used to throw a Crip sign thinking that he was a Crip and he'd spit on him and tell him, I ain't no Crip, I'm a bonnie hunter and the bus would take off. So Mario was always pushing bonnie hunters. And another thing about Mario, even the original bonnie hunters didn't trust Mario. He was like in the middle. They, they thought he was gonna be a crip. But I hung with the man, all 72. He ain't never hung out with no crips. He went to Markham, or you know, he didn't go to Markham, he went to Gompers and Locke. And that's why a lot of people, he was, in, he, was, he was caught up in the mix, man, because he was on the borderline. But when he went to YTS, he proved himself. I don't know how true it is behind him and Mac Thomas, but I think it got some truth to that because Mario was a squabbler. And if you read Tookie book, you read that Mario was in death row with Big Took and was playing basketball with this Crip dude. And the Crip dude kept pushing up on Mario and Mario put hands on him right in front of Tookie. And the Crip dude went and asked Tookie for permission to hit Mario. And Tookie told him, ain't gonna be no stabbing. You gonna fight him like a man. And the dude punked out and didn't want to fight Mario. Because Mario told Tookie, read the book. He told Tookie, I ain't no punk, man. See, Mario's a high yellow guy. He looked like a bartender, a pretty boy type guy. But Mario's a beast inside. See, people look at people and prejudge you. But no, once you put them blenders on them or, or you stab them up, then they realize you ain't the one but they might just look at your body and they don't see no muscles on you. They look at your face and hair, see you got curly hair and you look like a European, so they might can take you down. But in reality, don't judge the book by its cover, my brother, because you never know what a killer look like.